I have spent most of my adult life afraid to follow my dreams. That all changed when I realized that one day, this little guy will share his dream with me. He will ask me for my advice, and I will tell him to fight for his dream, or urge him to chase his dream. What if he asked me if I chased my dream? What if he asked me if I fought for my dream? I refused to tell him I didn't even try. Hey, do you see it? My name is Toriano Fredericks, and this is my family, Serena and Devin. When I started getting serious about chasing my longtime dream of starting a food truck, Serena shrugged off obvious fears and immediately asked me what she could do to help make it happen. Just like that, my dream became her dream. So we are taking our dream and placing it inside this truck. Welcome to our dream. What equal soul food truck? You are listening to the North Carolina Food and Beverage Podcast. Thank you for downloading and subscribing. Coming to you virtually live from high atop the historic Raleigh building in beautiful downtown Raleigh. The NCF&B takes the listener behind the scenes to tell the stories of the people that contribute to the creation of the food and beverage community of North Carolina. And now, the misfits in the dish pit, the faces of the front. They are Max Trujillo and Matthew Weiss. Hello, and thank you for listening to the North Carolina Food and Beverage Podcast. I am your co-host, Max Trujillo. And I am your co-host, Matthew Weiss, and we are getting soulful on the pod today, as we are very happy to be back in studio. And joining us in studio are good friends from Durham, owners, creators, soul makers of Boricua Soul. We have Serena and Toriano Fredericks. Welcome. How you doing, guys? Thanks for having us. Thanks for being here. Um, just before we get into everything, for the people that don't know, I'm going to use your like little tagline that kind of sums it all up, so get ready to understand. Uh, so you guys are Southern Soul, Caribbean Flair, Euro-African Roots Food. Yeah, uh, that's right. It's, it's a mix between, our food is a mix between soul food and uh, Puerto Rican food. So it's, um, <clears throat> it's basically how we have been, we were cooking at home. Uh, Serena um, is half Puerto Rican, and start that over. It's fine. <laughs> I don't know if it has it matters half Puerto Rican, but yeah, it's it's how uh, how we've been cooking at home, um, taking foods of our grandmothers. My grandmother's from Andersonville, Georgia, and Serena's grandmother's from um, Puerto Rico. Oh, nice. So it is a cross section. Would you consider this to be fusion food? I don't really consider it fusion food. Um, It's it's it. I guess it could be. Yeah, yeah, it's fusion in a sense, but yeah, so many of the things are. You don't want to get caught up in the generalities of fusion food. When you look at southern food itself, you have um, these mix of cultures to make to make soul food. So you have West African slaves. Um, you have the Native Americans that were here, and you have the Europeans. And you have that same thing with Puerto Rican food. You have the Taino Indians that were on the island. You have the West African slaves, and you have um, the Spanish. And um, all, all of these things come together to make a food, make a cuisine. Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's, and it, and it's celebrating our grandparents, um, and the food that the, the the celebration food that we ate, and and just kind of putting it all together. Yeah. So your uh, Toriano, your grandparents would have been cooking more just like what we I guess consider American soul food. Is that kind of easier to say? Yeah, that's mm-hmm. correct. Whereas Serena, yours would be more food from Puerto, Puerto Rico. Rico. Yes, sir. Yeah, and so then you're, the two of you did this like when you're just kind of dating or getting together and just having dinner was this like oh well i could this is what i like cooking and this is what i like cooking is like, is that how how did that come together i am not a cook <laughs> I'm, I'm not oh, and yeah. so i would say to him you know hey my grandmother would cook this or you know this is my favorite and he would 
rub his hands together like, oh, I'm going to mm. figure out how to make I'm that. I'm going to figure yeah. out how to make this. Yeah. Um, and so when we start, first started dating, Toriano, Toriano cooks nonstop at home. And so he would, he would take all these things. Um, he was also traveling all over the world. And so he would <clears throat> be in Singapore for, you know, 30 days and he'd come home and try something he had at a hawker stand or... Um, yeah, it, it was a constant, I'd eat something, and almost my whole time out at sea, I'm thinking about making that when I get home, and you know, and thinking about the flavors, and, and so I'd, I'd basically bring, you know, sea where I went home, because it, it was just in my mind to make it. Out at sea, you were Coast Guard or Navy, or? <laughs> no, I, uh, I graduated from the Merchant Marine Academy. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. that's why you spent time in Great Neck, New York, right, my, right. My, my birthplace, my yep. hometown. Yep, yep. And so, um, and so I'd, I'd work on various ships, oil tankers, uh, container ships, dredge. Um, the last six, seven years that I was out at sea, that was on uh, uh, drill ships. Wow. What, were you do- what were you doing on the ships? So navigation, basically. Okay. Um, I started at third mate, second mate, and um, on the drill ships, I was a dynamic positioning officer, and so that's basically just keeping the rig in one place while they're drilling for oil. What What's the duration of being on a ship without touching land? Like, how long would you go? Um, with the drill ships, it was just 30 days. Okay. Um, and I think think probably a max that I had ever been at sea was probably a couple weeks. Um, what about when you went to Iraq? That Wasn't that a six-month well, hitch? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's the second phone. Uh-oh, that's the bat phone. Yeah. That's, that, that's, that's the, that's my word phone. the body guasol phone yeah. that yeah. always rings at the wrong time, That's guys. the bat phone, that's yeah. right. I gotta turn this one off. I got an order. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are you open today? Which I love the realness uh, while you're checking that. I love the realness. Michael Bowling, who was on our episode last week, we're in the middle of something and he's like, uh, I got to go. We're like, what? He's like, sorry, guys, I got to get in the kitchen and get some stuff. <laughs> we're like, yeah, man, you're working. You're a chef. You got to do it. And that is real. It's like, hey, man, business needs to be had. And that's, you know, hey, we're in the middle of uh, trying to rebound and rebuild a yep. business post and mid COVID, whatever all that is. Uh, real quick, I know we'll get back into this for a second, but just on a comic side of this whole thing, I loved the first time we ever met, oh. uh, which I do believe was at the Durham Food, Food. and Be- what is it? Beer. Beer, 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 and, beer. beer and wine experience. Beer and wine experience mm-hmm. at the D-Pack. Yeah. And uh, we're, like Matt and I were just like, coming down an elevator with our wives or so. Guys. And Guys. <laughs> It's still one of my funniest moments. Please. I don't mean to interrupt, but no. it was Serena. You tell us when you happened. guys sent the um, email, like, "Hey, you know, let's get you guys on the show." I looked at Toriano. I was like, "So, are you gonna victory dance? Like, what, are you gonna like?" <laughs> I was like, "Cause we both, you know, the emails come to both of our phones sure. and they pop up." And I was like, "Oh, this guy right now, is so excited! I think <laughs> yeah. we were gonna have a celebration dinner just for." But why is that? He's been following you guys forever. Yeah. Oh, man. He yeah. listens to the podcast. like So he'll go off, and I'm usually home with our, with Devin, and I'll get like a link to the podcast. Like, <laughs> Here, I just listened to this. You need to hear this. Or, you know. you need to get some gems. Yeah, yeah. some gems in there. Yeah. That's right. No, it, it, uh, being someone who, who didn't have, who doesn't have past food experience, it, it was nice. It's been nice to... Um, kind of meet some of these people through you guys and get information and and learn uh, from, from what other people are doing that that actually know what they're doing, you know. So it's yeah. um, if there was ever more an affirming reason why we do this, that's it. Yeah, show's over. That's it. We're <laughs> and our new testimonial recorded. Well, it's so nice because there's so many things that he and I, you know, we're constantly learning through this entire process, and we don't have kitchen backgrounds. We we're successful on a food truck, which sometimes is still amazing to me. The fact that we are where we are and have this, you know, small brick and mortar now is is amazing. And there's all these questions like, are we doing this right? Or can we do something better? And we're, we're always bouncing ideas off of each other. And then it just seems like while we're bouncing these ideas back and forth, he'll listen to a podcast and it will confirm 
something or shift our focus. And that's when I get the, here, listen to this. <laughs> Did you hear this? <laughs> well, I mean, that's I, goosebumps. I'm kind of right there with you, too, because obviously, uh, with the exception of maybe one episode, I've been you know, on every episode. And, you know, me and Matt, I'm learning every single time we speak to somebody. And when I'm working in a restaurant now, wherever that may be, I realize that most of the stuff that I reference when I'm thinking of like a, an issue, a problem, trying to figure out a solution, most of them are because I heard somebody on our show give us insight before. I'm like, yeah, like it's really just helping me. And so it's not to say that the NCFMB directly is helping people, but it's the stories that need to be told that right. are that we find to be very important. And, and that's it. And it's like it really does help kind of connect the community. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know that like even in like Matt's line of work, uh, other other sales reps or even just sales reps in general like food sales reps they'll say man we like listening to this because it actually you're letting us behind the, the curtain of like the buyer that i'm about to go see and like mm. trying to figure out what makes them tick so it's like after we get it's to know them a little bit more we know oh don't talk to them about such and such because that's their hot button issue they don't want to discuss <laughs> but it really like it helps kind of i mean if anything if it does help that even if a salesperson learned how to approach a buyer better because of it it's better for the buyer, right? Like the buyer's like, cool, well, you did your homework, and you know who I am, you know what I want and not want, so everybody's already on the second chapter when they when they first meet. Right. So, yeah. yeah. And I think part of it, too, is it somewhat of a, like a personal milestone, like in a way, because I think I think we had just started the truck, and 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 I had I think I'd been listening to the podcast, but I sent you guys a message and I was like, hey, you know, we got this food truck, and if you want a perspective of a, you know, a husband and wife team starting a business, mm. and and we didn't get anything back, and what? And <laughs> Max, how could you? Max, <laughs> Max handles all the communication. No, 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 I'm blaming no. the crack in here. Yeah. She's not no. here to defend herself. And 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 again, like I don't take that personally at all. Like I know life. You know, it's busy. People are doing things, and then I think you guys interviewed um, Will from Will's Will's Commissary, who Will, um, and, Pops. Will and Pops. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and that's that's where our food truck is out of Durham, and um, and I, it was probably like two years later, at, you know, or a year later after I initially sent something and I said, hey guys, you know, you know, um, if you need some information about, you know, food trucking and someone answered back, yeah, and um, that said, was me. you know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so that's – okay, so a little behind the scenes of, like, how we'll build these stories. Mm. There are a lot of people that have restaurants or a lot of people that have food trucks. A lot of people have a distillery or a brewery or, or, or what have you. And so we want to tell a story that hasn't been told. And we've – like Matt and I talk about this all the time. We're like, if somebody – concisely sums up what this category of food is well then that's the story and right. uh, you know we'll we'll hear from somebody that wants to talk about their coffee program and it's like man we just had uh you know say larry's coffee on and they really got deep into everything and so two weeks later that would kind of be nonsensical to have another story about coffee and i think like we got so deep into food trucks with will which was a great perspective because we hadn't spent that much time. So timing wise, it's like wherein that might be a great story. We don't want to keep be, we don't want to be redundant. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And so, you know, I mean, this is the year of barbecue and we've done a few barbecue episodes. And then like even through the COVID uh, quarantine, we've realized that barbecue is still pretty active and like you can really it's, it's a very take outable type of thing. Mm -hmm. So it's like we've been doing barbecue things and we're like, well, maybe we should probably ease back on the barbecue because we've been doing a lot of barbecue. So it's just about having the diversity of storylines as much as possible. But this is something we haven't discussed because, for one, taking, uh, as you, you're saying, more like kind of amateurs or you didn't have a prof professional background, which is always interesting. Mm -hmm. But then also the blending of two culinary styles that we hadn't seen be put together. And then not just being a food truck, but then going on and being a brick and mortar like all of this is fascinating right right it's fascinating for us too <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, so let's let's and, get into that and, story. and also i didn't want to make it sound like um you know i was bitter or anything about not getting you guys not getting back it, it wasn't about that it was about um being being having value yeah and so so for for me it was a thing of you you don't have th what they need at the moment. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean. And so mm -hmm. it's more like, you know, as we're building our story and building what we're doing, at some point, um, this story will be, you know, useful or what what they need to get out there. You know. And you, so and so it's for me. It's never. It's and Serena knows this. You know, like it's never like a. 
I'm I'm the he, most patient, persistent he is person. So patient and persistent. And a, you know, where like I don't need to like, but you know, just as you do work. And, but it's in your head. Yeah. Like, well, yeah, and as you do work and you're building your craft and you're you're learning. you're adding value. So when you get to a certain point, um, and and that's why I say it's kind of like a milestone in a way because like for me, I feel like I've gotten to a point to to give some value to the show. I also just want to add in here that, um, you know, we do we do get a lot of requests, but I, I do know that, in fact, sorry to out you here, Max, but it was actually me who got back to them that second time. <laughs> and I only know that because it was for other uh, reasons of, like, wanting to build business in my in my day job and stuff. But what, what I think really validated is when I first met you at the Durham Food and uh, Beer Experience that I tasted your food. Yeah, it was about the food. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And... Now I'm forgetting what it was. I want to say some sort of meatball soup that was like spicy meatball. Mm. I don't even Oh, the caldo. Was it? The caldo gallego thing. I don't remember what it was that we served. Anyway, Uh. like the whole... My my memory is shot like all pre COVID. I don't even remember my kids' names. It's (laughs) a whole other life. But like all all I can tell you is I remember thinking like... That was awesome. Like, not only are the people cool because we had been messaging and right. I, and I, and I knew you had mentioned that you were fans on the sh- fans of the show, and then it was so rewarding to taste the food and obviously validation. And then I told Max, I was like, "Oh, you got to meet them. Yeah. They're awesome people, and the food's awesome. Got to go yeah, eat that." that. Awesome. But then, like, so Max and I had already decided that night. Oh yeah, let's let's get them on the show. But then the amazing thing is, you guys had already been recorded on a on an episode of Vivian Howard somewhere south for the hand pies with your empanadas. So right. like, mm-hmm. that must have been pretty validating when that was. Yeah, that is the fact. The fact that we are not food people. Yeah, and we find ourselves in these circles and in these rooms with such amazing, in their own chefs yeah. across like that to every time that happens it's like that pinch yourself like yeah. who are we we're not yeah when, we she, can't. when she walked up to the truck yeah we just we looked out we're like vivian howard's here right now this is like, she's <laughs> on our truck during yeah. the service you know like and for us to even that moment um we had been asked maybe a year or two before when she had released her cookbook um to sit outside of Carolina Theater, it was us, the parlor that were serving during her during like the pre party, yeah, for the release of years ago. Yeah. yeah, and it was just such an amazing experience to just see her and her kids walk by, and it was like, huh, well, this is pretty neat. They here, what are we doing here? Who right. are we? And so then to you know to 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 then be on the show and then go back oh. out and serve during. Remember, we went out to. Her season finale. Before then, yeah. Before that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah, Just, th- to be on that show and see all the other people that are on that show and have anything to do with that. Because I, we, there was a point, too, where we weren't sure if if our part was going to make the cut. And then we started seeing all the names of the people that were on the show. We were like, no, nope. <laughs> no <laughs> way. Matt and I are very familiar with not making the cut on that show. <laughs> <laughs> the, we you made the filmed, cut, though. I made the cut for a quick second. Uh, I talked about, like... Uh, pickled mushrooms or something but um but we uh what's funny is there's an episode on the somewhere south where they go to the opening of uh, benny's big time mm-hmm. which actually happened like two years ago and matt and i went there on opening night and mike lee was there and it's amazing, uh, great you know w- we were there the whole day and we did our episode about i mean maybe you've already listened to this before Toya, but um the Benny's Big Time episode we did on opening night in the afternoon, and then we just like hung out the whole night, had great food. But the cameras were all over us while we, while we as the NCFB were interviewing Vivian and uh, and Ben. And we're like, oh, cool! Like, I think maybe we're going to be on a show. That's kind of neat. And then a chef's life ended. We never saw our yeah. faces. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> And then when the somewhere south came out, we're like, "Oh, this is the day. This is where we were. Uh, uh, maybe we'll maybe we'll get seen." Nope. Like, no, uh, we're on the cutting room floor again. <laughs> <laughs> but we kept seeing these these like you know posts and listing of all these chefs, and we were like, "We don't belong in the same conversation as these guys." Like, because these are practiced and tried and true and like phenomenal people. And then here we are, the little... Well, little but okay, so let's get into that, because that is that is uh, what is so great about food, is it's the uh, universal uh, leveler, right? What is it like? It levels the playing field, because you might 
be better skilled, quote unquote, if you've had a lot of experience in the study and all that. But then you also just might have the talent at understanding flavor and components and, and seasoning. And, and it sounds to me like while you were alone at sea for, for many days at, on end, that you did kind of figure out what you wanted to do. I mean, it's no different than just kind of like a, a musician that didn't go to Juilliard or, or you know, the right. Berkeley College of Music, but just has it in them. And it's like, mm, I want to play this song. And now everybody can relate to it. And now it's a big hit. Yeah. So let's, let's get back into, let's get back on the ship. As you're as you're docking, you're getting there. You are you're constructing or developing what is or what will then be Borico Soul's menu. Whew. Yeah. Um, this is so multi. <laughs> I don't know that it was a. I don't Toriano from when we first met. He was always dabbling in something, right? Like he had um, a blog, a food blog, and he would go out and just talk to chefs in our area yeah. um, and that morphed into like this food photography thing because he had 30 days right, right? so right. he'd come home and have 30 days where he had no job right. and and so some and would so, yeah, the, play the, call of duty for 30 days right but Toriano's <laughs> like reaching out to these people in the in the food industry and saying hey I want to come take pictures. And even Roberto from Copa was like, why yeah. are you coming? What is it going to cost me? And he's like, no, 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 <laughs> because, no. It's not yeah, because free. I, I was, I was, everybody was expecting. So the blog was called La Buena Vida. And it was, it was basically about my travels. And, um, and so then it kind of morphed into speaking to, like Serena said, chefs here. And, and, and kind of telling their story a little bit. And so I did that with uh, Roberto and Kate and Justin from um, Roses. From Roses. Um, yeah. And so I, I, I built a relationship with them just being around and having my camera and wanting to, to be around people that were, that were doing something, um, that were kind of like following their dream. And so I'd make videos for free for people and everyone was kind of like, so what, a, what, what are you expecting here? Like nothing. I, I think I was at the time taking taking motivation from people too and just just per hearing their stories taking their pictures um at the time i didn't really know it was that um i had and, no idea <laughs> yeah no but, idea. but it always but you said he, he'd been dabbling in a lot of things but it always something around food, food. it's yes. always something yeah. around food and, it, and it's almost like when we started morphing going into talking about um, doing a food truck all of those things that i was doing now became useful yeah the food, the food photography the i was like that was your master's degree in it, running a restaurant and right. cooking professionally right right um or even building a brand right it, he he from the very beginning would and i would think it was crazy right because i'm like what is he doing now <laughs> he would um literally he started our instagram page the day that i think he be well before we had the truck. Well before yeah. we had the truck. He, like, the it was, it was a, almost a year before the truck, before we went into business, we had an Instagram page. Yeah. And, it, and it showed, That's you know. Way just, to build a brand, yeah, before. Yeah, it's like before. Create, create the demand. Well, you know, it's funny. Like, like Roberto at Copa has kind of a similar story in the sense that he wasn't a, he wasn't a professional mm -hmm. chef yes. in Cuba. He was a scientist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like a bio, what was he, a biotech Biochemist, scientist? Some, something Biochemist, something like that. I don't want to misquote, but yeah, yeah he was and in science. And he just also just had an affinity and a love and a passion for food. And when he got here, he's like, this is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. Well, he, it, he was also, he was like the de facto chef, right? Because they had actually had someone for Old Havana, their, right, their, the sandwich, their sandwich shop. But then, but then by a many different circumstances he he was like okay i guess i can do this and i'll cook yeah. no and definitely took motivation from spending any bit of time around somebody like that where you look at him and you say he's doing it he and, and serena would always say we don't how are we going to do this we don't know anything oh, like when we first started the truck mm -hmm. about about running a food business and i was like there are people that that don't there. And he would use, he would say, look at Roberto. Mm. He, and I'd be like, but, but no, how are we? <laughs> Let's not look at Roberto. You know, yeah, at the time, like, Devin is three. And I'm like, dude, like, what are you? What, what I can't are, even imagine because having a three-year-old right now that thank God is going to be four in a couple of months, in two months, like having a three-year-old and being an involved parent is a, Huge, huge undertaking within itself so the thought of starting yeah. a business at that point but, is 
it's crazy. Yeah. And then and then you have this added component of, you know, he's home for 30 days. And so he'd be trying to build this business and get this thing out on the road. And then it'd be a pullback and he'd ship back out. And in those very early days, people would contact us like, so you sell food, right? And no, we don't. <laughs> Not for the next 30 days. Right because now. I couldn't very well. I mean run a truck by myself. I still haven't driven the truck, guys. I, I like, because it scares me. I was, in, I was impressed this morning with your parallel parking, by the way, too. She's a New Yorker. Of course she can I, parallel park. I can always park. Now, my driving is something different. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I could get in a spot. Yeah. Um, but the, the momentum was what you were probably lacking by, by going back and forth. Yes. He, he would... I will want to just take a quick break to mention one of our awesome sponsors, the Folks Foundation, who is driving momentum right now with their Carolina Quarantine Project, which is a vinyl album that they actually put together with local artists that uh, showcase these songs they wrote while sheltered in place. The album just went on sale June 1st, and uh, it's available for direct sale. All of the profits go directly to the artists who are supporting art when you support the Folks Foundation, and that's essentially what the Folks Foundation is. It's a 501c3 nonprofit, and through ongoing grants at their publication, the Folks Journal, and their album, and the general store that they are building in historic New Bern, all go to supporting artists. So learn about more, read more about them at folksfoundation.org, and uh, also consider a small donation that can help support North Carolina makers. Folks Foundation, the champions of all good things crafted in North Carolina and the folks that make them. Nice. So let's cut to the actual moment of, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to create the business. We're going to buy the truck. Like, <laughs> how does that? And wait, Serena, were you working at that time? No, I was home full time. You were home full time. I was home full time with Devin. And I think... I always say I am Toriano's administrative assistant. Sure. So he would, you know, ship back out and it would be, you know, we got to do this, we got to do this, we got to do this. And, and you would this. execute? And You'd I'd be like, all right. All right, all right. Yeah. We do this. You need that. that well, yeah. He's, yeah. I mean, he's in Singapore and on a completely different time schedule. I'm here. And so there was this constant, and I was had a baby. I yeah. don't know what to do with that. Sure. That human. <laughs> right. The, wait, and, and before that, so when you're, so you're getting to travel, so that's helpful for inspiration, but like, you're sometimes at sea for many weeks. I got to imagine the food on the boat is not inspirational or enjoyable. So like, or, and did you ever ask, hey guys, can I get behind the cooking station and maybe help out here? Um, the, the food can vary. It, it all depends on on the on the cook at yeah. the time uh some some people took their job very seriously and um some people just like don't, didn't have as good food to work with as well so and sometimes if you're on a rig when i was on the drill ship you're cooking for 150 people not all at once but you know you're, you're cooking a lot of food so um when when i did get to the the blogging part I was asked a couple times at, on the rig to if I wanted to cook anything, and I was like, I didn't. When I was out there, I really didn't want to get involved, and and also it, that that idea of like coming in somebody else's kitchen, like yeah. I just didn't didn't really want to be involved in it. There was the uh, the cook on the dredge that I upset uh, because he used to he used to wear gloves in the kitchen wear them out of the kitchen oh. and then come back in the kitchen and just think like, so I confronted yeah, him about it one day. It's fine. <laughs> and I, I, I basically couldn't eat his food the rest of that trip. Cause oh. like, I was like, this guy is, is mad at me. And so I, I'd, I'd go into the galley like late. Cause I was, I think I was working like a midnight shift and I'd cook, you know, and then like clean up and be like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> people are starting to figure out what gloves mean and during this whole COVID crisis. Right. That, like, and cross contamination. Your yeah. hands are still going to be, filled with bacteria and disease you have to keep washing your hands even if you're wearing gloves right wash the gloves right. or throw them away but also gloves from what i learned recently are one of the most uh carriers of right. all the they like track they, and hold yeah and they hold bacteria. on to the exactly yeah right. that's neither here nor there so let's get to that moment where you're like all right we're gonna do it we're gonna get the truck we're gonna put the money forward like this is going to be our profession yeah so we we did it in pieces, so we we decided okay we can we can buy a truck. I don't have to quit my job, um, so we're taking some risk here. But I still have a day job, 
And and I think Serena st- still thought I was crazy, obviously. But my, no, I did. My, my brother did. still do. Today. My, I do. Yeah, <laughs> I do. <laughs> my brother-in-law had a truck uh, that he he was going to make a I think a coffee, coffee. truck, a mobile coffee, mobile shop. coffee shop out of it. And um, he just got busy doing other things, wasn't able to execute. And so he had this truck sitting around. And so I said to him, you know, what are you what are you going to do with this truck? Do you want to sell it? Um, and he said that he did. And I, this was that trip that I took to Spain. I was, I was in Spain and I was in, in a ballast tank, basically in the bottom of the ship, like cleaning. And, and oh, he was so mad because he was supposed to, it was his off time and they like called, he had been calling him and he didn't answer and I don't know any better. So I pick up the phone and they're like, tell him to get on a flight tomorrow. He's going out to sea. We need him in Spain for the next six weeks, and yeah. he had just gotten home. And I was like, "Wait, what?" Mm. And yeah, and 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 so you have you have you have to make a choice at that point. You know, you can say, I, you know, I don't want to do this anymore, or you know, you go to work like the man said, go to work. And 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 that was a big eye opener for me. I said, I don't like the fact that somebody from Texas can call here and say, "Get on a plane." Yeah, you know, and and, just... and, and that's that. And. And then I thought that they needed me there for some like major expertise, you know, because mm-hmm. I was, uh, I, we need you here. We're doing sea trials. We did like a day of sea trials. Then we got in the shipyard and now I'm sitting in a bilge, you know, like watching, watching a tank. And I said, like, there's, there's something, there's something better. Sure. You yeah. know, for, for, for us and, and for me. And so I, we bought the truck when I got home after that trip. And then so th- that was, that was, that, like, that was uh, yeah that that was the commitment at least buying the truck and, and and again it was just being unhappy where where i was in life and and the fact that someone could just pull pull this pull all of our strings basically yeah now you have your truck it was outfitted for a coffee shop so did you have to get it like re- redone so that you could it was a forward? complete empty shell when so oh, okay. he hadn't started construction on the truck there was just a wrap on the front of the truck, mm-hmm. um, but it was an empty hollow shell in the inside. Okay. And Soriano had like looked at other trucks and those trucks weren't right. And he had spoken to food truck builders and um, Jack of all trades by George, who used to outfit our truck said, if you're gonna do this, it's best to just bring me an empty truck. And so this, it was like all the stars started aligning, right? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. we get this truck and it was, reasonable and then it's empty and george says yeah i could i could work with this and he started piecing out the builds and he was able to piece out the builds and work with toriano's 30 days on 30 days off oh yeah. so he, but did you know at that point like what exactly you were like what food you were going to cook and so mm-hmm. you could kind of build it spe- you did know okay. yeah mm-hmm. yeah at, at that point we knew um we wanted to do something that was kind of like street food, but comfort food, yeah. you know, and empanadas, you know, are great hand carry um, things. We knew mac and cheese. Everybody loves mac and cheese doing that sure. Southern style, you know, the way grandma does it. Um, and we knew uh, Puerto Rican style roasted pork, Perni would, would, would be a hit here in North Carolina because yeah. North Carolina loves pork, but it's just a little bit different spin on it. And we knew that taking some of those things, we could um, bridge the gap between a cuisine that most people here don't know and cuisine that people here do know. So taking mac and cheese and putting the pernil on top of the mac and cheese is, is an easy leap for most people, you know? Right. Putting the, putting the what on top? The pernil? Yeah, the pernil. It's a Puerto Rican style roasted pork. Okay, so that yeah. – gotcha. Yeah. And yeah. can I – what's – so what's different about a Puerto Rican style roasted pork than what would be traditionally done in like – whole hog barbecue it's that kind of thing fairly sim. it's, okay. it's pretty yeah, much it's, the same technique it's just seasoned it's a seasoning, seasoning. Yeah. Yeah. it's um basically sazon garlic oregano vinegar a uh, you, you make this yeah it's a lot of garlic you make this paste um and then you rub it on on a shoulder or a butt and you slow cook it for about depending on how big it is six five six hours okay and then and then you pull it basically and you can do all that at that time you can do all that on the truck you could slow cook it yeah, we were doing all that out of, out of the at a commissary kitchen mm-hmm. okay and i think we we kind of i know when toriano first bought the truck 
it's it's like this ingrained moment. We were driving out to Ashboro to go to the zoo with Devin. And we were sitting in the car, and he's like, well, what if we do barbecue? And I'm like, all right, because we live in North Carolina. Let's, let's do something that everybody's doing. Like, why don't we think of something else? And we were bouncing off, bouncing ideas back and forth. And I remember opening the glove compartment and pulling out a notepad and, like, literally started writing down. The truck, like, started to more – the ideas – started to morph during that trip and we were like well what what do we name it and we're like kicking things back and forth and writing things down and and walking around the zoo that afternoon with Devin who was 3 and figuring out like this is what the truck is going to be this is what we're going to serve this is what it's going to be called now we have this direction and then everything else just started to yeah. fall into place so let's way. talk about the name and then like where that comes from and like kind of the, the culture behind that. Boricua soul, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So what do these words mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, Boricua is a Taino Indian word for person who's a native of the island of Puerto Rico. Okay. Um, and then taking soul, you know, matching the two things, the soul food, Boricua soul. Yeah. Is there, um, well, I should say in your travels by any chance, did you ever make it to Puerto Rico? Mm-hmm. And so you have, uh, so you've been there. You've, you've been in the land and like, and had authentic food there. So you had some perspective of Puerto Rican food. I mean, assuming, of course, I know you would have some perspective from your lineage and all. But, uh, but yeah, did you? Yeah, you, I I first went to Puerto Rico as a cadet. Actually, I was on a ship that we. I think I got on the ship in Jacksonville, and we went to Puerto Rico, picked up equipment, and then. Went to Diego Garcia in the middle of the Indian Ocean. I ended up coming back that way and going to Puerto Rico again. So I did it. I did get to spend some time down there, oh, cool. and then vacations and stuff. Sure. Yeah, I, I need then, to get my myself to Puerto Rico for one too. Yeah. <laughs> so, so do we. <laughs> we need to get back. <laughs> yeah, but I, I've been to Puerto Rico. But like what most of us see in Puerto Rico is like the 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 touristy part, and it's really. I mean, I'd like to see more of like the soulful real puerto rico outside do of the some, tourist do some good right. eating yeah yeah, yeah we, we we took an anniversary trip down there as well and we ate everything everything do you guys <laughs> speak spanish at home no okay so it's really 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 interesting so my grandmother came um from puerto rico in late 40s early 50s okay um and only spoke spanish yeah and she then my my mom's my mom and her siblings came along and and they were bilingual because my grandmother didn't speak any English. Right. And they were a lot of times my grandmother's translator in school. And by the time all of us grandkids came along in like the 70s and the 80s, there was this massive push for us to not speak Spanish and to be Americanized, yeah, right? right? And so they felt, I, I know my grandmother, she would... From a, from a child, I would read C. Dick, the C. Dick Jane books yeah. in yeah. Spanish because while my mom wasn't pushing Spanish, my grandmother was like, no, this is going to be very important. And so I have this like weird, I can read it, write it, understand it, listen to music, watch TV, sure. completely get it. But my Spanish speaking is mm. awful. And I, Yo I, tambien. <laughs> so you get it. My, yeah. You just and, need a couple of glasses of wine and, and then it'll I, loosen you up. Or I just need to like s- to be immersed long yeah. enough. Um and so I we don't. And it's funny because Devin is in school now and he gets Spanish daily for an hour every day and he like ha- speaks better than I do. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> this is nice. It this comes nice. back to it. It does. All right. So let's get back to the food. So so you you get the ideas, you're you're cooking with gas, not literally. Um but you kind of conceive the menu, conceive the concept, everything, and then uh what's next? How do you get into action? So like how do you start picking you had the Instagram account but like how, you have to get a commissary kitchen, then you have to get all the stuff and then so you go in you go wh- wh- where was the first gig? Our first gig was Pittsburgh. Yes. The Pittsburgh yes. Street Fair. And that, yes. that would have been September of 2015, I think, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so, yeah, that that was our first gig. And that was, I think we just had like a couple empanadas 
No, or, or menu no, was, was stupid. Oh, no, that's when the menu the, was long. The, yeah. It was ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> and and we look back at it now and we're like, how were we even cooking on this level? And it was just the two of us. The menu was so there are pictures now that we yeah, see when we and we're, see like, we're like, what's going on with that? So menu? many options. Like super yeah. ambitious. You mean? Super, super ambitious. ambitious. But at the time too, the amount of food that we were set we were not selling as much food either. So we were able to it just it, it would be difficult to do that, to do those menus now from a food truck, um, you know, doing doing the volume that we that yeah. we yeah. would do now. Well, you're finding your way, though. I mean, that might be that might be something where being an amateur versus a long time experienced person, that would be a mistake that maybe you'd make sure. in the beginning. But it seems like you figured that out, yeah. which is also pretty great too, because you got to find your way. I mean, who knows? Maybe if you didn't have the 40, 50 different options on a menu, you wouldn't have found the one that like has been really singing well on your menu. So what are like, a, what's a really good example of something like what's one of your best selling dishes on your, on your truck or in your restaurant? Um, in the restaurant, the Boricua Soul Bowl, which is, so it's a, basically what, what we would eat almost after every shift on the truck. So yeah, I would eat. <laughs> <laughs> so we have collard greens, we have mac and cheese, tostones, which is uh, fried plantains, savory fried plantains, um, the pernil, and the, the mac. Yeah, I think I said the mac. And so f- for me, at the end of every shift, it was like I'd have I'd take a little boat and I'd just get a, a little bit of each one of those things, and I get the plantain and I kind of use that as a as a spoon. Yeah. And when we opened the restaurant, I was like, we're gonna people have to eat this because that the crunch of the collards with, you know, the mac and cheese and, and taking the toast on and using it. Um, it's awesome. And so that's, that's pr- probably our best seller outside empanadas. I mean, empanadas are individually the best seller, but that's our best selling platter. Yeah. And also it, probably the most representative of the food because and, it's such a mixture and, of everything. Exactly. Where do the empanadas come in? Because the empanadas are like South American. Well, we but, have, a ver- Just, Puerto Ricans have a version oh, of they it. Do. They're just okay. they're just called pastelillos instead of empanadas. Okay, we, it's the same. Hand it's the pie same hand pie with filled meat. with with meat, and and it was one of those things that we, I am a dig my heels in like this is the way it has to be, right? Like we can't say this is Puerto Rican and then you do something crazy to it, which he does. <laughs> <laughs> and so when we were having these these empanada conversations versus pastelillo conversations, it was always. You know, I'm like, no, that's not what we call them. But then we realized a lot of people wouldn't know them for that. Yeah. And so... Like empanadas is an easier leap for people. Because a lot of people don't know what empanadas are. But yeah. And then it, every time the conversation, oh, what are pasta use? Mm-hmm. Oh, well, they're, they're empanadas. Right. Yeah. And then it's like, <laughs> just, just call them just empanadas. Yeah. Just, they're, they're just, <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. And especially in those very early days of food trucking, you know, we're going back 2015. People had no idea what what we're about right so you'd get these people that you know have lived in north carolina they're born and raised and they have no idea what this is what this food is and they'd come over to the truck and it would be such a conversation of this is what this is it's just it's prepared pretty much the same yeah um you know it was this huge kind of like teaching well i I still think like even you When you say, like, oh, what's Puerto Rican food or what's Caribbean food, like, there's a couple of things that come to mind, right? Like, of Mm -hmm. course, always beans and rice. Mm -hmm. And Caribbean, you have, like, jerk chicken and Mm -hmm. the jerk sauces. But, like, Mm -hmm. oh, and mofongo, yeah. That's my heart. (laughs) Yeah, what is mofongo for? So it's mashed plantains fried, and then you use it as, like, a boat, and you can fill it with fish or chicken or pork. Yeah. Um, and the, yeah, and the, the plantains the are mashed. It's got um, chicken broth, crack, yeah, cracklings Cracklin. or bacon, whatever you want to use. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's it's awesome. That's so. When you go to your website, you, there's an awesome video that you put together. Who did that? Did you do that, or did you have some help? There's which, like which video there's like a little it? YouTube video that kind of tells the story of how you got started and why you did it. It's our Kickstarter video. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, did, I made it. It's beautiful. Thank you. I want to use it at like the top of this episode, if I may, like yeah, just the yeah. audio, because what you say is so great about pulling it all together and how 
like you you did bridge the gap between the two cultures, you know, and and you two are the the definition, or if anything, your child is the definition of the two cultures, you yes. know, growing yep. up. And so, uh, yeah, he's the um, <laughs> the tangible version of what uh, Bariqua Soul kind of means, right? Which is pretty cool. And uh, and the video is kind of like for him. It's it's the p- point of view is like this is do I. Uh, do I follow my dreams? Do I follow my passion? And when this little boy grows up and looks back at what I've done in my life, do I tell him that I did follow my dreams or do I tell him that I got caught up doing other things and led a different life? And it's like, I truly believe and I love that you followed your passion to do this. Um, so it, it's, it's an honor to just like, well, it's, it's, it's beautiful just knowing that like you had the forethought of, who you are to your son and who you are to your uh, community and, and what it is. And then, and you built on that. So, uh, I love that. So kudos okay. to you for that. Um, the, during, uh, the, the, the COVID quarantine and all, you were able to remain open and to continue to kind of push that, that message out there. And still, because I guess even just to be real simple, your food is very take outable, right? Like sure. You sure. can easily eat it and people got to eat. So, like, what was like? What was that for you when, uh, when the governor kind of changed uh, the rules about you know what you could do? How did you approach that, and how did your business adjust? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we we made changes in stages as um, in March as things started to happen, and, and American Tobacco, um, basically all the people that were coming to work there, our lunch crowd was kind of our bread and butter. So all the people, our lunch crowd was gone. So we started scaling back. Um, our business basically and and so I was going in and working it was myself and I think I had one other person and and I was doing that and Serena was at home taking care of Devin uh, because schools had closed and everything and then we got to the point of thinking you know I'm I'm here all day they're quarantining in the house and how what's what's the safety level here you know um i know what i'm doing all day i'm not sure if as if we we can pass this to each other as employees working in the kitchen and so we decided to take one week off and just shut everything down and then kind of figure a way forward and we decided that way forward would be for me just to go in by myself and and just do curbside yeah and and to make that possible we had the hours of four thirty to seven and you had to order online. So that gave me the ability to just have the orders coming in. I don't have to answer a phone. And when, when people arrive, I could just run the food up to them. And you're doing everything in terms of like plating, packaging, running the food. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think I was able to do that by myself for like, like a week. And then it got to the point where, uh, Serena started coming in and, and basically we're like, okay, we're quarantined inside the restaurant. Devin can come to the restaurant um, because we didn't have the ability to leave him with Serena's grandmother at the time too, because again, you don't know exactly things are changing. People are getting sick. So we're like, well, we'll just bring him. He can sit in the dining room. There's nobody there. Yeah. And then it was the two of us. And then as information, another thing I we wanted to see is, our kitchen being so small, we weren't sure how how we could work in that kitchen and socially distance. And we were just afraid that we um, of getting other people sick, getting ourselves sick. So we wanted to see um, how just what happened as far as kitchens, our, our kitchen staff and other places starting to get sick. And we didn't see that. Um, and then after a time, we started bringing bringing our our guys back. Just again, one person, one other person in the sure. kitchen. Yeah. Until until it built to the point where last week we I was like we need everybody <sighs> in the kitchen. <laughs> last week, last week is it was one of the most difficult weeks I think we've had. Um, for what reasons? It the systems. It was a, yeah. for us. It's 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 relearning, right? So we had only been open five months, you know, and here we go. Prior to COVID. Prior yeah. to, prior to COVID, we don't have restaurant experience. You know, we had been running the food truck for a year, yeah. you know, two years, and so we had just figured that out when we opened the restaurant, and then COVID hits, and everything shifts, and mm. there's this huge change, and now we have you know, DoorDash and Uber Eats and curbside and we open the patio. And so now we're serving at the tables. And-, yeah. and, and, you, and you have to think about the fact that when we first 
opened the restaurant, that was such a learning curve for us in the first place, figuring out how, how, how do we, because you remember, I think our first day in the restaurant, it was extremely busy. We did well. And, and we were patting ourselves on the back and we thought we were, were champions. Day, <laughs> day two, oh, was, day two was about the worst thing. Like, and you have expectations of yourself it, or it get, or it, it got even busier. It got even busier. No, oh. it got busier and just the systems that, that we had in place, um, they, they weren't, they weren't good enough for, you know, the pass through that we had there. And, and you, you just have this feeling of like, what, what have we gotten ourselves into and how do, how do we fix this? And, and again, we, we talked to our team and we sat down and we just, we figured it out. And then, then now we're, now we're rolling, now we're moving and we're like, okay, you know, we, we have this somewhat figured out. Um, and then something like COVID comes along and then, you know, it, it, the, the bottom falls out Yeah, and then you, you're learning again. You're now trying to figure out, okay, we're, we don't want to let anybody in our dining room. Our dining room is tiny. So mm -hmm. we have these big glass doors. Okay, let's move the tables there. And we have a patio. We can have everybody sit out there. But now, again, now we're, 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 we're learning a system of, okay, how do we expedite this? You know, how do we make it work? And it's a management thing as well, right? Because sure. before I'm able to see... Physically, I can see customers and I'm taking orders and now everything is online. And so outside of those customers that are walking up onto the patio for service, I have no idea what's happening in the kitchen mm -hmm. because Uber Eats and DoorDash and they're just printing the online orders that are coming through automatically yeah. print. And I, so I have no idea what they're managing. And and then now I'm answering the phone for curbside, and I'm walking and over. She's running curbside, and I'm running curbside, <laughs> and I'm running food to the to the patio. That's a that's a, a a fine point you're making right there, and it was something that I didn't realize too. But I'm like I'm helping back out over at Y Hill uh, Kitchen and Brewing, and they have a huge patio. And what we had noticed is that when you have a lot of servers. Uh, which they all had like the hands-free kind of like entering system mm -hmm. through Toast, which is a fine, not sponsored product here, but it, uh, is it, Toast is a pretty good uh, machine to use for restaurants. It's so intuitive and so quick and also like onlineable as well and everything comes in. It's like there's an ease of it, of getting the order, mm -hmm. but that's not the problem. The problem is the volume of order Orders that, comes, that through. comes through. We found that like, okay, I know we could have we could have seven servers, but if we had like four servers that are running around a little faster, mm -hmm. uh, it might pace out the kitchen. Yeah. So you're not getting 93 orders all at one time. Right. And so that becomes really a struggle. And, you know, any any kitchen just hearing that printer going like <laughs> you start snapping into focus, you know, it's Pavlov's dog. You're like, ah, <laughs> and going nuts. I mean, that becomes a kind of a. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. You yeah. look at the tickets that oh just keep God. furling over themselves. They keep rolling and rolling, and you're like, "Yeah, it becomes. It's like that's now no longer the problem. It's too much of this is now turned into the problem, and so you want to be able to minimize and limit that. So yeah, we've got to relearn restaurants as well because mm -hmm. because no matter what, things you know maybe things will go back to a, a, a version of what it used to be, but there still will always be this element of of a lot of online ordering, mm -hmm. a lot of delivery, a lot of you know just distancing uh i think and that's fine it's actually probably a good thing to just uh accept that as part of our normal and then be able to understand it but yeah the the the, the complexities of what that means really does affect the the kitchen in in a crazy way right. so super crazy yeah it, it it's just another another wrench that's thrown into yeah. the, the mix but, and, and it's rewarding to figure that out on a you know on a, on a small level because uh friday night you know, Dead. We, we got we got beat and we went home and we talked about how how we how how can we make this work better and you know we put some things in place we took um curbside away mm -hmm. but we told people we do have a system that when their food's ready we could text them it sends a text automatically um but someone has to manage the ipad someone has to consistently make sure that and and i figured okay that's going to be my job and our kitchen's small and we had to figure out, okay, how do I do that and not be in the way of everybody else? Um, but we got it done and we got through service, but we went through that service like half afraid, like waiting for, you know, shoot a job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, and then, you know, we the level, done. you know, like, and I, and I, I didn't realize how much 
kitchen workers work off, run off of adrenaline, right? Mm -hmm. And so (laughs) I'm often (laughs) like this crazy lady running all over the place, running from the kitchen to the customers, um, and how, what a level of high you run off of for so long. And then when you crash, it's like, literally, it's it's the bottom out. And on Saturday, I kept running over to the window like a crazy lady. And our our food truck manager was like, calm down. Like, it's okay. We got this. So you don't have to look crazy. (laughs) I was like, no, but but if it happens, I want to be ready for it to happen again because we couldn't manage it on Friday. That calm before the storm when you're working in restaurants was always the worst because you're like, oh, I'm supposed to be relaxed now, but I know the shit's going to hit the fan and we're going to go crazy and tickets, the printing machine's going to be nuts. But I think that's also, that's just the restaurant business Mm -hmm. in general, right? Like, Maybe it's not as large as a global pandemic or rioting, or but there's always something, you know, like whether it's an HR problem, a sourcing problem, a, a building issue, there's always going to be stuff in the restaurant business, which is like, that's why you guys are completely certifiable nuts to want to get into it. But. <laughs> well, and, and COVID <laughs> has, has exposed and highlighted mm-hmm. all the, and it's, and it's made them, like it's magnified them, right? And like, yeah. you know, we, we, Cock- Toriano had this brilliant idea to offer brunch boxes in the beginning of, of COVID. Brunch box and, um, you know, you don't even realize that you just, U.S. Foods isn't delivering the way they used to deliver. Right. You mm-hmm. know, so, so now we're like a food lion trying to f- source all, you know, we go to Restaurant Depot, but Restaurant Depot has started serving to the public. So their shelves are bare. So now you're like piecing these boxes together piece by piece. And and I don't think the public realizes, you know, because for them it's cook. Well, you it is just, weird how that three system, that three tier system, breaks down so quick when in a, in a in a pandemic or or whatever you're going to say, because you know you, you buy from a supplier and then then you create and then you sell, mm-hmm. but when the supplier starts freaking out, they're like, oh god, what do we do? <laughs> like we don't have enough people, you know. It it breaks the system and then you know chaos ensues but also potentially new ideas come from that you know so i don't know i mean maybe maybe it's an easier way to start servicing the community at this point by embracing technology and changing the way we uh use our vendors as Mm -hmm. well and yeah there was there's a lot of runs to the grocery store that probably didn't happen (laughs) before um what about just obviously we've had a lot of talk about the racial injustice that's been happening um, here in in downtown Raleigh. Our last episode, we you know talked about it in depth about what was going on. But what was the, going on in Durham? Uh, it seemed, at least from the news, a little bit more peaceful. Uh, I would say, but um, your restaurant as well. I mean, how did you did did you prepare for it, or what did that mean in general? Um, Durham has remained wholly peaceful, um, so much so that that Devin had asked to go to a protest and I don't feel uncomfortable doing that with him because Great. it has been so, and I sent Tori out by himself as like, yeah. Cause we, 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 I think it was Monday last mm-hmm. Monday. Um, I knew that I wanted to go and we knew that we wanted to expose Devin as well, but it was still kind of, you know, early. I think at that point, um, um, things had happened here in Raleigh. Mm-hmm. And so, we were unsure kind of how things were going to go, but um, so I I went down and yeah and 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 it was it was kind of it was an amazing day to see that many people um, downtown supporting like letting their voices be heard yeah um, and we we definitely wanted to be a part of that. We're a bit more insulated at American Tobacco. Um, I feel like. People that are looking for us that know we're down there can't find us. It's it's, it's, it's not the easiest to find, as, as I will <laughs> attest, I will testify. But yeah, so we're a bit more insulated just from location. Sure. Um, even though we're a block away from City Hall and the, you know the courthouse, we're still kind of off yeah, because you're in like path. the back of American Tobacco. Right. If you walk in through the front, you got to walk all the way to the back. But you could, I guess, you could go from the outside, right, and, and come that, in and come in through mm-hmm. the patio. That would probably be easier. But yeah. Um, Logistics of location. So we haven't had to um, really take any any precautions. Yeah, we'll, yeah we, I, well, every day we bring our furniture and, um, yeah. from the patio. Mm-hmm. Yeah, from the patio. Yeah. But, it, 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 I mean, it's refreshing to see that Durham handled this. And, I mean, I, I, 
not not a commentary on how Raleigh. I mean, it's it's not an easy thing to deal mm-hmm. with, but I, but it, it's just interesting the dichotomy of seeing what happened in Raleigh and then Durham was so peaceful mm-hmm. and it was it was on the heels of because you know I, the the most of it happened the late Saturday night uh, in Raleigh, like the most of the the damage. I know there were some on there Sunday, was a lot on Sunday too, Sunday but, too, but yeah, yeah, but uh, like the predominant. But then Durham it followed suit and it was like. No, we're going to do this peacefully. Mm-hmm. Everyone went home, and then I guess some of like the uh, the instigators of, of violence or rioting couldn't do anything because there was no crowds to be covered in. Mm-hmm. So I think that helped as well. Yeah. But yeah. I'll say this: I was in uh, I was on Glenwood uh, just uh, just yesterday, um, getting some pizza from Demos, which is a great place to get some pizza. Um, but I was getting some pizza to go, and I don't know if anybody else noticed this, but during the COVID time. Do you notice that like there was a whole lot less eye contact being made? Mm-hmm. Like it's almost like people thought they could get it by looking at each other or something. And and so I, I noticed that immediately when I was going out in the public for whatever reason. You're at a grocery store. It's like I, I don't want to even know, acknowledge that you're right next to me. It's like look, man. Like we're all just out here trying to get some toilet paper and some <laughs> Lysol. <bread. laughs> Lysol. Yeah. It's like we, we can look at each other. Um, oddly enough, like throughout all of this tension that's been going on, you know, with the public. Uh, Everybody, I'm like walking down the street, I'm like going to order pizza, then later like carrying a bunch of food with me. Everybody's looking at each other in the eyes, whether mm-hmm. they have face masks on or not. And there was so many like nods of like recognition, like, hello, how mm-hmm. are you? What's going on? I see you. Everybody kind of doing that. I, I love that and I want that to continue more than anything. And I, I feel like that's a, I feel like progress is being made, which I, I, I hope, you know, and that the, the protests are now being what they are protests and, you know, and, and standing up for what we feel is going to be the way life should be and recognized, you know, and, and not like, a uh, an opportunistic time to, to, to cause mayhem. Right. Like that's that, I think that message got muddled and, you know, Lord knows we talked a lot about that last week and there's a lot of <laughs> spurs off that, like why that might've happened. But I think the, the, the underlining message of why the protests are happening that message is being brought to light more than anything else. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think it, it's, it's an important conversation. Um, and it, it's something that I think America just keeps, you know, kicking, kicking the can down the road. And, and it's, and it's going to take people having that, those hard conversations and taking, taking an internal look and, and looking at their neighbor and, and, and figuring out, what you know the path forward and and that's difficult because everybody everybody has their own idea of what that is but i i think it starts with we we talk about compassion all the time Mm -hmm. um and i think it really starts with being compassionate even if you don't understand understand somebody yeah um and we, we talk about this a lot as well we talk you know when you have there's that conversation about the difference between you know slavery or or some someone will say they'll have the argument well slavery ended some odd many years ago and yeah it it did slavery ended like years ago but what about all the things that have come after it like Mm -hmm. there's there's a lot of pain there's a lot of broken families um and when someone says you know well my my immigrant uh family came here in the 1940s and and look what look what they've built and and I always say, but they they brought everything with them. They brought their their culture. They brought their language. They brought their religion, and they brought and the, the, and they kept it. Yeah, right. Right. Like you kept your your name. You kept your family. You kept your culture. These things weren't stripped from you. You were able to keep them intact. You know, your name may have been Americanized, right? But you know, you even moved into a. Uh, a neighborhood where you had neighbors from, you know, maybe the same the, town, the same yeah. town. Village, yeah. And when you when you have that, someone may call you a slur. This, but you know, you're collectively in your group going to look at them, you know, and say, <clears throat> "We know who we are." You know, you can't you can't hurt us. You right. know, and so and and they built together, and they and so it's it's interesting. You, we, we talk about our grandparents all the time. You know, I was raised by people that grew up during segregation. Yeah. You know, and 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 so their their mindset on on life is is you know from what what they knew, and and they didn't have 
great examples of what they could be, you know, and, and mm -hmm. people, well, people look at, at, at us or look at somebody and say, well, you know, you're succeeding, you're, you know, you're doing well. And, and that's, and that's fine. Like everyone has the chance to succeed, but just over the, over the years, there's been so many barriers to make it harder. Yeah. And so you, ha you have to ask why, why is that? Well, you know? it's important to know where you come from. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, like I was saying to Matt before, before the show started, it's like in, in my life and I only can speak to my own, you know, history or whatever, but so my mom is of Latino descent, but she also was raised in a white orphanage. Mm -hmm. Right. And so there wasn't a lot of records being held as to like who her family was prior to that. And, uh, and we just, you know, and then on my father's side, he was kind of irrelevant into the family. So I just know my mom and my brother and that's it. And then like some of the women that she grew up with, we call our aunts mm -hmm. and like, and so, uh, but basically it was like a Latino household, but my mom went back like when she was pregnant with me and like purposefully tried to find out who her mom was and who her father was. And then ultimately through the years, we actually found everybody. And so then mm -hmm. this family of Trujillo's were unfolded and I realized it was a massive family and there was so much history. And so then we were like, but at the time I also was like 13, 15. It was like, cool, that's cool. But I also was a teenager, didn't, that wasn't my primary goal. So it's like, it was there though. And then now I can go back and through ancestry.com and all mm -hmm. that, you can learn more about you. And I feel like I understand where I'm from and where I come from. Mm -hmm. But the unfortunate fact of the matter is that through the slave trade and all, it's like records were being held, and right. very few were. So it's really unfortunate. And and I know this sound, might sound really trite, but like I was telling Matt, like if you've seen like the most recent Star Wars, the Rise of Star, uh, Rise of Skywalker. I'm not going to give anything away. It's just a beautiful moment where the uh, you know Lando Calrissian, who's uh, Billy D. Yeah, Williams. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because obviously he's black. There are two other characters that are younger that are black. And at some point in the movie, he's like, where are you from? And one of the gals, she's like, I don't know. I was taken from my family when I was really young and was like raised as a stormtrooper. Mm -hmm. And he's like, well, let's figure that out. And she's like, what? And it was like, he kind of was like, that. that's what we're going to do. Yeah. And like for me, like not being African-American, but just being a human, that was the best part of the entire movie. Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, like let's put some effort forth to like know our history and like maybe maybe I don't know the answer but maybe somebody else does and maybe somebody else can do that and just connecting the dots to understanding the lineage of everybody where we're all from it's our it's our right as right. humans right it is and it's hard because a couple of years ago we decided to see, to start uncovering our own roots and I know for me my mom's Puerto Rican but my dad is black and Italian I started to go back into um, the African American side and try to uncover where my great my grandfather was still alive at that time and and I kept hitting these roadblocks I could not find his father I couldn't figure out mm. where he came from yeah. and how he became a Wilson right like this is our last name why can't I find Wilson's and really it was because his father was the plantation owner and my grandmother was his, his, well, my great grandmother was his slave, right? And so this whole time I'm looking for this family of Wilsons that don't exist because they were not Wilsons. And the man who ultimately gave my great grandfather his name adopted him later on. He married my great grandmother and, and that's how we became Wilsons. But he's not. You know, the, there's yeah. this roadblock, right? And so... Well, the name Wilson is the son of Will, which was a white thing, thing. that came from, like, from the UK, you know? Like, right. It's so crazy. It has so no connection none, to your family. None. Yeah. And right. so you start, like, trying... It, but he, even he is not biologically... The Wils Wilson is not biologically my grandfather's father. Yeah. Right? And so, like, there's all these things. And so when someone says, you know, get over slavery, like... <laughs> that happened so long ago. How yeah. do you? Because yeah. this is literally one generation removed from ours. You know, we were listening to a podcast yesterday while we were cooking dinner. And it talks about, um, it's called Berry Truths. And it talks about slave and, and relations in the South and these, these, this brutality, police brutality, boys that are being killed in the 60s and the 50s. And 60s was... 10 years before we were born, yeah. right? And so, like, you can say that this should not matter, right? But this is literally yesterday. Yeah. In, in, the, in the grand scheme of things, it was yesterday. Um, and the same injustices are what we continue to see today 
they haven't changed. Um, we just get to keep watching them on yeah. the news. I think anything that's in living memory where you can speak to someone who has at least spoken to somebody who has experienced that. So like, you know, slavery a couple hundred years ago, but it's very possible that like an oldest living had a very older mm -hmm. living relative that actually spoke, like that probably has happened, you know? Yeah, and, we, we, yeah, we well, talk yeah, to Tori's grandmother all the my, time. My, my grandmother, something she would regularly say to me when I was younger, you can't do what those white folks do. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and again, that, that was just beaten into not, not just a thought, it was her life, mm -hmm. you know? And, and, it, and for her, to me, it's, it's like a, a warning you know like no you you can't do what those white folks do yeah you know and i'd always be like you know just a kid like what <laughs> well and then we have to have these conversations today with our son right and so you know we grew up in the north which is a different place mm -hmm. does racism exist in the north absolutely is it as in your face as it is in the south not at all right and so here we are and and devin he always hits me with the craziest, like, I'm paying attention when you think I'm not paying attention, mm -hmm. right? And oh, so yeah. he's got these big um, headphones that he uses to play drums that he's always walking around with. He's listening, he's playing Switch, or he's on his Wii U, and he's playing music or whatever. And I don't think he's listening. And I, it was amazing to me how much of this situation he picked up when he asked, can we go to a protest? And mm. I was like, well, why are they protesting? And he said, well, you know, George Floyd was, was killed. And now we have to sit down and have this conversation, right? He's seven about um, what you do if you're stopped by the police. And I start running down my list, you know, keep your hands where the police can see, um, always be polite, always be respectful, make sure you tell them to call mommy. And, and Devin looked at me and said, but that's what George Floyd did, mom. Mm. And I was like, Whew, okay, I think dad is going to be the one that takes this <laughs> over because I can't handle it. And, you know, it, you have these conversations with your kids and, and like we keep. He's being told you can't do what that just breaks my heart to hear you know those right yeah. with those white people do and now here I am you know having the same conversation with our seven year old about what you need to do right and I'm I'm a child of a New York City police officer right. you know like and so you know to have to I've been spending all this time saying Devin if you're ever lost the police are there to help you you know like don't be afraid yeah. you know just like you're not afraid of grandma. Don't you, they'll get you back to me. Mm -hmm. And now I have to shift a bit. Like I have to explain the rules. That's not what we should be teaching our kids. Like, but the one I, thing I've, I will say that like we have gone through such a dramatic change in our fundamental structure of, of life and business through technology, mm -hmm. right? Like cabs were a kind of pain in the ass for a long time. Then Uber happened. And then uh, 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 hotels were like expensive and hard to get in. And then, Airbnbs, Airbnbs happen. <laughs> and then, and, and so, like, I know this is like a weird connection of dots, but we are able to make change happen faster than ever before mm -hmm. because of our communication levels and because, like, I mean, you know, we can, you know, you, you were direct messaging us on the NCFMB. We just eventually, comp, you know, uh, responded because Matt wanted to sell you wine. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> let's be honest. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but we're able to all get in touch with each other whenever we want. And, you know, there's there are different ideas of like what uh, public defend uh, uh, public defense uh, means or, or um, security and and policing and all these things are happening. So much is in our our mind right now and in the Devin's mind and mm -hmm. Cam's mind and Charlotte's mind that these are our kids names that like. They're young, and this is real, and this is something that they're not just reading about in a textbook. They're living this right, right. now, and it's their world as much as it's ours. It's actually more their world than it's ours mm -hmm. at this point. We've we've already exhausted most of our time here. So, like, things will change because mm -hmm. we want this to change. And mm -hmm. so it's just – we just have to keep hammering it home. And, yeah, take, take our kids to protest. Take and our kids, explain it, right? And yeah. have these real – because it was so uncomfortable for me. Yeah. To have this conversation with him about how, you know, like I, I grew up in a precinct house like that. My grandma died in 88 and my mom was a single mom and she didn't have anybody keep me like I grew up in and around these police these officers, police officers yeah. all my life. And now to sit and have to, like, keep your hands where 
you know, they can see Devin and, and, and be polite and, and make sure you tell them to call your mommy and we'll figure it all out. Like, like, why am I still having this? You know, like yeah. how do, why am I explaining this to a seven year old? It's, it, it was extremely uncomfortable. Um, but so important, right? Because he is picking up and I keep telling him, even with COVID, we are living through historical times. The world is topsy turvy, but my goal is to keep us healthy and happy. Mm-hmm. Everything else, you know, if the, the restaurant business bottoms out, like we will figure that out. Healthy and happy is my priority. And then you see these images, you know, and they continue. You know, like I found myself becoming um, increasingly angrier, right? Because we just came off of Ahmaud Arbery and and then Breonna Taylor. And now it's George Floyd. And it's like, is anybody else seeing what's going on here? Because this is crazy. He's never home when I have to have these conversations and I can't even kick it over to, you know, daddy can explain it better than mommy. Um, It's heartbreaking. Yeah. Yeah. As as Chef Moore said, Chef Ricky Moore said last week on the podcast, he's like, it's tiring. It's Mm -hmm. exhausting. Like to have to just keep saying the stuff and keep doing it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so, but unfortunately we have to keep. Yeah. Yeah. But hopefully when we say we, it's not just black America that's saying we have to keep saying this. Mm -hmm. It's all of us that have to keep saying this. And and then maybe we won't at some point because Mm -hmm. we've gotten to that point. Well, maybe that technology part kicks in and then all people are required or police officers are required to wear body cams. And not that it's even a referendum well, on only police officers, but yeah. that would be at least a step. Correct, I think we have to uh, correcting technology. <laughs> it's kind of my own like, my own personal opinion, not supported by the uh, NCFMB, but well, even, I think we have to figure out a, 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 a new way to do a lot of policing. <laughs> well, and yeah. even you know, for us, we had um, after the Raleigh riots, you know, we we're obviously we're having these conversations at home, and they're you know very much a part of our day, and we had posted something on our on our feed on our social about um about the protest and the amount of backlash that we received from just standing up and saying what we feel was kind of amazing and some people were like we're we're disappointed mm-hmm. that you're yeah, taking somebody. this stance yes. and we're not going to support you anymore and that was hurtful in itself that, right that, because it was it was because it was a shut up and cook moment like, yeah. You know, because it, it literally was. And, and and it's hard because so much of what we do is personal. It's rooted in race. Yeah. Right. Boricua soul is race. Absolutely. And so and this is our community and these are our problems. And, <clears throat> and and this is where we live and this is where we go to school and this is where we work and our staff. You know, these are our staff's issues as well. And so for for someone to 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 tell us we shouldn't have an opinion because we're a business, we are a business that is built on on this very thing. And so for you to say I'm disappointed in you having an opinion really is like just we like you. Yeah. If you do what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah. You're not supposed to do anything outside of that box. It's just also ridiculous because I, th- I feel like everybody in our, in our culinary community looks to chefs and business owners. I mean, they're all leaders in thought, not only in cooking, but in thought. So whoever that was, person is needs a little bit amazing. of education in uh, modern times. But, you know, I, I think, like you said, everything that you've worked for and put into is, uh, and no matter what, has been a, a, your restaurant, Borico Soul, is going to be a shining beacon for that. Not only, but it, it's exactly, it's a reflection of you. And, and that's the one beautiful thing about, like, hard work, business, and, and uh, stick-to-itiveness to do something. Yeah. So kudos to that. And keep fighting okay. back on that comment, that type of mentality. Everybody, like, somebody tells you you don't have a, a place to stand on speaking out about something. That's their fault. That's their their problem to, to bear. It's not your fault to speak when you're spoken to or to not speak out whenever. That's your right. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's 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 your you, your American and your human right. It's this such this this these <clears throat> contrasting point of views all oh, the yeah. time, oh, sure. right? It's well, you, you know, you your side versus up. my side and it's like uh, we are very much a business. And and Toriano had addressed this at one point in the thread. We, but w- this business is not a corporate conglomerate, and you know it's run by massive figureheads that you'll never see that sit behind a desk. 
this is our business. Right. And and we are allowed to have a personal opinion because it's a personal business. Right. Um, and, and it's a person and, and, and it's, it's run by that's, people. That, that's affecting that affects our community, mm-hmm. you know, and and if we could use our our platform to help move the conversation. Uh, because there there was even parts in that conversation where I was enlightened a little bit, you sure. know, and and that's what it's all about. Someone um, someone speaking up and saying, you know, respectfully, but, you know, and I can agree, I could learn, I could, you know, or say, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to keep, you know, my thoughts on that. But that's what it's about. It's having a conversation. And I think a lot of times people and businesses, you know, get so tamped down by a conversation that they they're afraid to have one mm-hmm. right right because they're afraid that um you know letting their opinion out um but it but it if, if you don't have the conversation again it just keeps being pushed down the road and there's never it never really gets fixed everybody thinks that it's fixed you know like great we had a black president so everything's fine and it and it's like we we're talking about the this morning like when you really think about it that's that's something wrong too when you have was it forty? It was forty four? Forty fourth president. He was the forty fourth. Yeah. And Obama was. And that's the 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 first one. You know, has there been anybody, you know, in the past that can do that job? Well, <laughs> just that in itself is saying that they're not e- something's not equal just yeah. because it happened now. That's a long time for. It. I was saying to my wife last night. It's like when you when you think about uh, so many of the firsts of you know African American first this African American first that. It's the, the narrative was so kind of lousy that uh, speak to Jackie Robinson, right? Mm-hmm. The, the narrative of Jackie Robinson was not only was he the first African-American uh, baseball player, but that they said the, the storyline, the media line was that he ha- or, or even like the, the, the coach of the Dodgers, the Brooklyn Dodgers said, Jackie, if you're going to play, you have to be the best. Mm-hmm. Like you have to be better than everybody else to be accepted into this. Mm -hmm. And that's even more fucked up Mm -hmm. because why can't he just be like the seventh best hitter on the Dodgers and like Mm -hmm. be a good role player like, you know, some other guys are. But it's like, not only did he step up to that challenge, but he was the best. Mm -hmm. He's like... He has more stolen bases of like home stolen bases that are that will ever happen. No one will ever break that record. Like there are so many things that he's done that he did that were far greater than other players, and he had to do that. Like he felt compelled to do that, and that's fucked up. I wanted to be a situation where if you're the first black whatever, that you're kind of like mediocre, and like <laughs> and there are far better people out that 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 skill than you because it doesn't fucking matter, yeah. right? But like, but that that narrative needs to like continue to evolve, and 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 you don't have to be the best at everything. You just have to want to do it and live your dream, mm-hmm. right? Yep. yep. Uh, all right, we have gone way over, but this conversation <laughs> well, was awesome. Yeah. No, I, I, this is these the conversations we need to have. Um, we we need to you know have these conversations as much as possible, but. But we do need to go to the get to yeah. the end here. We got to talk about the thing that really brought you all the way over here from Durham to downtown Raleigh, and that's proof alcohol ice cream. Yes, <laughs> you've been waiting for this for for a long time. Yeah, since even before they were sponsors of the podcast, you're like, man, I need to get my hands on this stuff. Uh, but we do here at the kitchen, and it's the first time in a long time we've been able to hand a pint of ice cream to our guest so uh so when we get out of this little uh, studio here we will invite you to the proof alcohol ice cream freezer to get, select whatever flavor you'd like whether it be apple pie moonshine or bourbon caramel strawberry mm. moonshine mm. coconut mm. rum uh, i think i'm getting excited now you're, yeah you're, you take a couple coconut of coconut rum there's seven no. percent alcohol <laughs> in every pint of ice cream uh think differently about dessert our friend uh our friend jen down there in uh greenville south no, our friend out there in Columbia, South Carolina, created this great concept of merging ice cream with alcohol into one little pint of ice cream. So, uh, so yeah, do that. And when you get it, where could you get it, Matt? Well, you know, you can, if you really like it, get more at the Triangle Wine Company. Ooh. And Triangle Wine Company, as you guys probably well know if you're fans of this show, has been one of our best supporters of our show. And they are one of the best wine shops in this entire state. And they have four locations. Uh, They are in Holly Springs, as you guys know, my neck of the woods. They have their flagship in Cary. They're in Morrisville. And they're out there in Southern Pines. So covering a large 
portion of the triangle and other parts of the state for all your wine and other beer and beverage and vermouth sure. needs uh they're also online so you can go to trianglewineco.com you can get delivery still doing curbside service and if you mention the ncf and b you get a nice discount as well so make sure you go there i think i'm gonna bake an apple pie just Ooh. to top that sounds awesome <laughs> you can put the i I, ice cream on top, top of, of it, apple right? Pie. Yeah. yeah, that's 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 where my that's where my focus may be. Heck yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, thank you very much for coming into studio for doing this podcast. We're talking about everything that you do. Uh, it's inspiring. It's fun. It's delicious. I'm a little upset that we don't have any more fungo to eat right now. Mm. It, does, it doesn't we, carry well. It, it doesn't. doesn't. Carry no, well. you have to eat that hot. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that sounds well. Then that gives us a reason. Yeah. We yeah. haven't put it on the menu yet, only because we've been trying to figure out restaurant life yeah sure we did it on the truck a couple times it's easy but well and this is all the reason for everybody everybody out there go to Boricua Soul you will not only eat and drink merrily but you also think very merrily as well thank you thank Thank you you guys thanks for listening to the NC F&B podcast and if you've stuck with us this long review us on iTunes and remember five stars are encouraged